Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. I'm so thrilled to welcome back the wonderful Kate Siegel to talk all about her latest Netflix series, Midnight Mass. And I wanted to start by talking about your character development process for this show, because there's so many beautiful moments in the first couple of episodes that are actually very internal for your character before we start getting into the spaces where she's revealing a lot of details and a lot of her backstory in a, in a dialogue driven manner. And so when you were looking at the scripts and starting to work on who you envisioned her to be and finding her energy and her charisma, how were you looking at those very early scenes where there's a lot of exchanged glances and quiet moments between her and other characters in really figuring out how you wanted to approach them and start communicating to the audience who she is as a character. I think this character more than anyone else I've played, I was able to see her as a part of a whole, as a part of an organism. When we talk about some of the past parts like Viola, she was her own thing. And whatever I wanted to do within this confines of this episode and this style, it was fine. I can make a big choice here, big choice there. But with Midnight Mass, my role in the story is very specific. It is very subtle and it's very grounded. It's more about the quality of light than it is about big choices and explosive moments until the big choices and explosive moments. But you don't get both, right? If I started sobbing and crying in episode two when I see Riley, then then it makes the boat null and void, right? You don't, if I um, am smiling, full smile at everyone I see, there's times I choose to smile at Riley are null and void. We don't enjoy the whole aria if each of the notes is at full volume. And so with Aaron, I thought my job early on was just to strip away layers and layers of preconceived notions and choices and ideas of who I wanted to be and consistently go back to what I knew, which was the story and the script. And I had such faith and such trust in my scene partners and in the production team that I knew that if I was doing too little, they would say like, just like, mm, let's, let's bring it up a bit. But even in watching it, the, the harmonies work so well. You have, you have Hamish Linklater singing Soto Voce, just like full homilies of dragging us through the gates of hell. And you have you know, the breakdown of Joe Colley when his dog dies. And I love the way that Aaron just kind of is there until she's, everyone else is gone and she's your reluctant hero. Her world is literally burning down around her before she picks up the mantle of hero. And there's so much to unpack when it comes to her backstory as well. And particularly when we look at her relationship with her mother and the reveal of a lot of the abuses that her mother inflicted upon her. And, you know, that that notion that the community has of like, she was always a wild child. She ran away. She did all these things. But really, it was a means of escape and something that she really logically was planning throughout her entire entire childhood of like the moment mm -hmm. of 16 this is my plan this is what I'm gonna do and so many of her actions were about that escapism before coming back um, and so how did you really take a lot of the fabric of what she'd experienced throughout her childhood and that idea of past trauma to really build a lot of the emotional fabric particularly as she's going through this journey at the beginning of the show of becoming a mother herself there is a deleted scene where Aaron goes into the confessional and speaks to Father Paul before everything starts to go south about her coming back to the island. And you learn more about her husband, her abusive husband, and when she decided to leave. And she comes back to the island. And this monologue is about her, truly about her feelings that Bev poisoned Pike. And she's saying, I know this happened. I can put these pieces together but I know I won't say anything. And that's a sin. It's a, it's a lie of omission. And she talks about how all of these people, they loved my mother, my mother who was a drunk and beat the sh shit out of me. And they loved her and now I am teaching in her position. I'm living in her house. And these people always thought I was a black sheep and that I ran away and then I came back pregnant and I'm going to step up to Bev Keen. Never gonna happen. I'm never gonna accuse them. And that cowardice in me is a sin and for really great reasons that monologue is removed but having that monologue as a character made it very clear to me the balance I was creating in the story which was Aaron Green um, believing herself to be a coward and Aaron Green allowing herself to be a hero and the self-esteem journey between those two things 
And so there's a lot of different emotional prep work to do in substitutions. But for me, the thing <laughs> that worked the most was reading this Stephen King book called Rose Matter, which is about an abused woman who leaves. And there is um, the beginning of the book before it goes tremendously off the rails in the best Stephen King way possible is a moment by moment description of an abused woman making the decision to leave her house and getting to the woman's shelter, like beat by beat the choices she made. And I just decided I'm Rose Matter. I'm going to steal from the best. I'm stealing my backstory and my preparation from Stephen King. No one will ever know. And now everybody knows. <laughs> that I, that it was that. And I would just put those chapters on my iPad and read them before some scenes to be like, this is where I was. And I, I don't think that's stealing because it doesn't show up on the screen at all. And it just inspired me to make certain choices. <laughs> but also in terms of the way that she takes the lessons and the things that she's learned from her past and interjects that into interpersonal relationships and the way that she communicates with other people. She comes across as a character with a real emotional intellect. You know, she comes out in a, a, a really difficult abusive marriage and is like, I choose to trust people and to see the goodness in them because I need to be able to do that. You know, and even the fact that she doesn't call people out on things like you were saying, and she doesn't step over, she'll say things that she doesn't like, but she's not gonna step into a full space of judgment. And she knows how, when she needs to really hold things back for the sake of the other person. And, um, you know, yeah. we really see that culminate a lot more towards the end of the season. Um, and when you were looking at a lot of those just like little details as they pepper in and really build, how did that help you in terms of shaping a lot of the interpersonal dynamics and how she was going to approach all these different relationships that she has within the community, both good and bad? Erin, you're correct in her intellectual IQ is through the roof. And I think if, if we're going to make a bad metaphor, if she had a superpower, it would be how quickly she processes and digests trauma and how she quickly she turns that into something useful in her life. And a lot of that stuff is in the script. And so I would look at the relationship with Bev and I think it's written so with so many layers and so much complexity, knowing she was my mother's best friend, knowing she was probably my teacher, knowing she's now my coworker, knowing she was the woman at church and I was not at church when I was a child. And so I throw the word heathen around as, as like a label for myself. I think that came from Bev. I think Bev was calling me a heathen when I was a teenager, like sneaking out. But when your whole world is an island, you run out of people to burn bridges with. And I think that is a skill Erin learned is that she assumed she knew she was getting out, but as a child, she had to live with an abusive mother. She had to live with a very judgmental community. And she learned very quickly how to kind of maneuver those situations within that. You know, these victims, people who are victims of abuse in that way, of emotional abuse, they become very good at reading people because they can see the storm coming. And Erin is a superhero at that. And so she can kind of get her way through almost anything and the, the power of Erin in this arc is when she decides to stop doing that, that she's just done changing who she is for other people. And for me, that moment happens for Erin in the boat. She's done. She sees this, like the worst thing a person can imagine, literally or figuratively, the love of your life is burnt to ash in front of you, just in the moment after he tells you he loves you burned to ash. So that's horrific and traumatic and also metaphorical in the sense that everything's burned away. And when she comes back to that island, she's done playing around. She can see the matrix, she can see the ones and zeros, but she's going to change what she doesn't accept. And when it comes to that space of her processing trauma as well, jumping into spoiler territory a little bit now that the show's out, I wanted to talk about the way in which she processes the loss of her child because, again, there's just so much complexity to everything that comes with that. It's a hugely traumatic experience for her to go through to begin with. And then there's the experience of almost feeling gaslit where people, you know, are saying, oh, you must have miscarried and not realized. And she's, she knows that she didn't. And then to the point of you were never pregnant. There's no way that you were pregnant. Um, yeah. And she, again, just deals with it in a really 
emotionally intellectual point where she's dealing with that grief and with that trauma and at the same time she really manages to understand a lot of what this means and find some of the positive elements of what being pregnant did for her life and the fact that it really saved her in so many ways and maybe that yeah. was the purpose as well um and so how did you approach that thread and the way that that really shifted her as a character and again was another kind of metamorphosis for her as a character within those moments as she's unpacking all of that this is a great example of when backstory can be very useful. Uh, I spoke with Mike Flanagan at length about Aaron's backstory, almost probably to his annoyance. And um, one of the things we decided is that before we meet Aaron, she had suffered a miscarriage, not this pregnancy, but she had been pregnant in the past and her husband had beat her to the point that she lost the baby. And so Aaron knew without a doubt that this wasn't a miscarriage because she's like, I've been through this before. This isn't her wondering if maybe it was. And so that's the feeling of where's my baby isn't like, give my daughter the shot from terms of endearment. It's no, 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 you guys, what's going on here? Because stop telling me I've had a miscarriage. And so that's it. It's you hit the nail on the head with the gaslighting thing, because that's what's happening here. Everyone who turns to Aaron and goes, no, honey, you didn't know you had a miscarriage and you know, no, like, really, I didn't have a miscarriage or no, you weren't even pregnant. And she's like, yep, yeah, that's weird because I have an ultrasound that shows I was pregnant and no one's listening to her. And I think it's another one of those moments where you have to imagine Aaron leaving that clinic on the mainland and thinking, well, I could go to another doctor. I could get Sarah to fax or email me my files, but instead she goes, I'm going to go back to that island and figure out what's going on. And so she gets back on the boat to figure this out. And then she takes the time to mourn what she has lost because it's gone. That's true. But it's a very different trauma than a miscarriage. It is a trauma, a lack of, a lack of grounding in reality. It was a loss of reality. And also it's the first time that the blood of the angel does something terrible to a person because before it's it's healing Lisa it's uh it's healing uh Riley's parents back and her eyesight because it's trying to get you back to the prime of your life and it's one of those devil deals right you think of course I want to be in my prime I want to be young and fresh and I can see my body doesn't hurt but you forget that a pregnancy is a very intense thing for the human body and any parasite would be like, nope, no thanks. Don't have time to feed this zygote. And so it gets rid of her pregnancy. I also want to talk about the on-screen relationship with Zach Guilford's character, Riley, because I think that's so beautifully played and constructed between the two of you with all of the different complexities that come with that. There's such a friendship element to it. There's so much romanticism behind the way that they interact with each other. Even that very first moment where she's like, how are you? Like, no, really, how are you? In taking those tiny lines of dialogue and what it means and what it unpacks of their history. And there's even the romanticism of the time apart and the idea that they've been in each other's minds during the years that they haven't seen each other as well. And so in constructing that with Zach, how did the two of you really work, not just to initially create what that idea of their history and their backstory with each other was, but how you really wanted to show this incredibly beautiful evolution of their emotional connection to each other throughout the show? I was very lucky to get to work with Zach Guilford. He is like a deep reservoir of talent, like oof, what a good, great scene partner to have. And we work in very different ways. Zach is very much the, hey, I memorize my lines and I show up. And I am very much the type to do a lot of unnecessary work to calm my nerves. And, but the truth of the matter is like at the core, we both love storytelling and we both loved our characters. And there was a level of trust between us very early on because we were the first two actors to shoot. So they, we did it sort of in blocks. It was Aaron and Riley and then Riley and his family and then Aaron's crew. And then, you know, the rest of the whole world falls apart. And I suppose Hamish and Sam Sloyan are in there somewhere. But um, so Ryan and I are up first. And this is July of 2020. So we're one of the first productions back. And you get to work and 
in already in a panic because people are separated from their families. Borders are shut down. Like, I don't know if my family in Maryland are going to be healthy. Like everyone has this like very intense buzz to them. And everywhere I look, it looks like the movie Outbreak. We are wearing yellow surgical gowns, K N95 face shields and goggles underneath the face shields. There's no Nobody else I can see except for Zach. It's just his face. And we we bonded right away because first of all, we'd had the chemistry read and we knew we liked each other. We got along well. And then we just dove in because there was no other way. You couldn't, we didn't have the time to fake it because we wouldn't be able to chit chat in the green room and create a chemistry. We just kind of had to have faith in each other. And that I believe shows on screen that sense that we only had each other. And I love the moment you're talking about where she asks him, no, really, how are you? Because we all have seen this in our friends, our dearest friends, where they're just like, they're saying the things and they're like, well, you know, and I did this and then I went away and I'm okay and it's hard. And you're just like, stop, man, just stop. And we gave that to each other in real life because we were able to talk. He was separated from his family at the time and that was really hard for him. And I had two young kids at home and I was back at work for the first time. And that was really hard for me. And so the intimacy we gave, gave each other, I think, resonates on screen. And when it came to filming the scene where the two of them are just sitting on the sofa talking about their idea of what life is, what death is, you know, their religious beliefs, and even, you know, Riley's getting really in depth about his atheism, but the journey that took him there and your character is processing, you know, everything that we were talking about just now, you know, along many other things and her beliefs of what life and death and God and spirituality is. And that scene comes into play in two really pivotal moments in, in the show. But what I loved about watching that moment is the fact that it breathes and it lives as a scene and it is a two-hander dialogue driven moment and it's fairly lengthy but there's still no fear of just allowing the two of them to sit in silence and to pause in all of these moments between the dialogue as well and so was interested in in how the two of you really navigated finding not just the moments in terms of the tone of emotion but a lot of those moments in between where you really just wanted to take those steps back and take those pauses that is mostly credited to the power of Intrepid Pictures, Trevor Macy and Mike Flanagan, and also Mike, Michael Feminari, our DP, because I believe, and my experience is on set, actors take those pauses naturally. They're mostly edited out because like you said, it, it can be a long scene or it's too much dialogue or it feels like it's too much and the audience won't wait. But actors are taking those pauses and Michael, Mike and Trevor fought at every turn to make sure that that stuff stays in the show. And Netflix to their credit supports filmmakers in that way and knew that Mike, Flan Mike Flanagan is the type of filmmaker who's gonna deliver long monologues and give the actors space to work. And so I was lucky enough in this situation to have a whole team behind me who is supporting me in finding my way through that beat by beat, knowing that it would be respected and protected. There's also a lot of them, a lot of moments throughout the show where at the end of the scene, it, it allows just that moment to linger. It doesn't necessarily cut away from a scene the moment that the last line of dialogue is delivered. And is that something that, you know, with what you were saying about how those moments usually exist but are cut out, that that exists often? Or was that a difference in them waiting a little bit before they would call cut with a lot of the scenes to give you those moments? I think it's funny, I, I would challenge you to go back and watch again, because actually it moves at quite a clip. Yeah. What it does, and this again, I don't, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse. The man's a genius. Mike Flanagan gives you transitions that gives you that kind of space. He'll cut right out, but then you'll go somewhere where you're getting either a beautiful shot of the island or you're following a character walking or somebody picks up, is sewing a banner. And it gives the audience time to reflect on what they have just seen before they're taken into the next place. It's that the genius of great writing is in those transitions that allows you space to think while the show continues to move at a clip. And then I wanted to talk about in, in the last couple of episodes, obviously there's, there's a monumental shift in terms of the tone and what's happening. 
and how you really took all of the essence of what you'd built into Erin as a character up until that point and really carried that through into how she responds to such, you know, absolutely insane and horrific situations happening all around her because there is a frenetic energy to it. But again, you really still carry that energy and that ideology of who she is and how she approaches situations, the way that she's processing trauma and, and really thinking logically, what are the next steps that we need to do? If we're going to buy ourselves a few minutes, this is how we're going to do it. And this is why we need to buy ourselves a few minutes. And there is that idea of, of real selflessness coming out of her again yeah i think hmm, that this is something that I, i'll just share i i question that at every turn every single time a scene would start and everyone's freaking out and aaron's just standing there and holding her stillness and her her errandness after cut, I'd be like, I don't know, man, I feel like I need to like run somewhere or like maybe I should like shake a gun at someone or maybe I should like tear at my own skin. I just feel like more needs to happen. And this is a very, um, it's a it's a signpost to me that I'm on the right path because when you start to get to vulnerability, true honesty, your body wants to put up walls. It doesn't want to be naked in front of a whole room full of people, morally and emotionally speaking. Probably not literally speaking either, but that's not my job. Um, so I would look at that and I would run over to, because of the COVID situation, run over to the tent. I'd put on all the PPE and I'd run over to where they're directing and I go, I feel like maybe I should. But you know, the thing is, if I do that, then I'm going to, what I want to do is, hmm, I get what you're saying. And he has not said a word to me. He's just standing there looking at me and I'm working through it. And eventually I go, I think I want to do less. He's like, yeah. And I'd run back and I'd do one where I tried to do less and less and less. And I was always, for the first time in my career, I was always trying to find that bottom. Like what is the very least amount I could do? What if it was just a blink? What if it's not even a blink? What if it's just an exhale? What if it's not even like, and just trying to, do that. And I believed every artist around me from like Hamish all the way down to, to the kids, everybody was working on that level. Not what can I do less, but like that level of focus in making sure that the story that they were telling was the best work they were capable of doing. And it, it, I think it was a group inspiration that really lifted it. And then this is getting very, very deep into spoiler territory because I wanted to talk about the final moments of the entire <sighs> season and that moment where there's such peacefulness and acceptance in Erin when she has this angel on her back and everything again is still about buying time, thinking about other people. And even when you have the knife going through those wings, it's not a jabbing, it's not a quick rip them to the side. It's a very, let me look at you and distract you. And then just, you won't even notice that I'm slicing through yeah. you, um, which was such an interesting, unexpected pacing for a moment like that, that we just never get to see in film. And so was that similar to what you were talking about with the other scenes where there was an opportunity to kind of play it in different ways and really kind of work on finding that, that version of, of less, but how less is so much more in a moment like that. No, I wanted, we, I, by the time we got there, that was the last, my last shot of this whole season is this insane crane shot that started up here. And it's truly, if you think about it in filmmaking land, my monologue had already been shot. The back and forth edit was going to happen months later and the cuts to all the other people. This was a three minute shot of me staring down the barrel as I die. And I was like, oh, I'm going to drop this at the one yard line. I'm your QB one and I'm going to drop this at the one sports metaphors, um, drop this at the one yard line. And by that point I had been through Aaron and I knew that the, I knew the secret, the secret was do less and we must've done it. And I'm there. He's playing the audio track of my monologue so I can kind of hear it and get into the space. But also on top of that is all the weight of this being my last shot of the season of having wrapped Rahul the day before of having wrapped the, like of having wrapped Annabeth the day before that. And just like losing these people, literally losing them one by one because they get on a plane and they go home. And there was a, a moment where it was happening and, and the shot was happening and it, it wasn't quite there. Right. I was, I was doing all the right things. I wasn't moving. I was breathing. I was allowing 
for time to pass, which is sort of what I think about when I think about letting go of any preconceived notions about acting, but it wasn't quite there. And after a take, I just, I just broke down and I said it, I, Mike's there and I'm very close to my hair and makeup team. So Lilia and Krista are there and I'm sobbing and I'm like, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to fail. I'm going to drop the ball at the one yard line. I'm going to fuck up this whole series if I can't get this shot. And I truly believed in my heart that I wasn't going to be able to do it. And of course, because they're my friends and they're also professionals, they're blotting the tears off my face and they're fixing my hair. And Mike comes running out of the tent. He's like, stop, 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 stop. She's exactly where she needs to be. Stop comforting her. She's there. She just doesn't know it because I had completely internalized Aaron's emotional state, which is all of my friends are dying. This may not work. And if this doesn't work, we failed, right? And like, even now I'm getting goosebumps about it because I didn't see it. I was holding it and I didn't even see it. And so he was like, everybody get away. And he was like, get back on the ground. And it was like so much a coach moment. And I loved it. And I, and I was like, oh yeah. And so I sat there and I melted down. And like the second I laid on the ground, I was able to stop the actual act of sobbing because she doesn't have the blood in her body to do physical stuff like cry and the second I was able to control it they called action and that's what what ended up making it into the show we only did one more I only had one more in me and then I was after the whole shot was done which is just that crane shot the other the wings the clipping of the wings of the angels that happened in inserts obviously but that one crane shot was the important shot when that was done it was that's a wrap that's a series wrap on Kate Siegel and normally um like I was number two on the call sheet. And so normally you're supposed to give a little speech. You're supposed to thank people and, and congratulate everyone on their hard work and kind of let them know that you're aware that it's not a job that's done by one person. It's done by a, a team of people. I was incapable. I couldn't stop sobbing. I couldn't stop shaking. I couldn't pull it together. And I always thought that that was like a thing I did. Like Kate Siegel, she's got her shit together. She can pull it together, give a good speech, smile pretty. And... I, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever had a gift as loving as the fact that the crew and my cast who had come for my rap and the showrunner who is also my husband and Trevor Macy, who is my producer, also married my husband and I was the officiant at our wedding. They stood there and they made space for me to be like that. Nobody rushed me off set. Nobody tried to stop me. Nobody tried. They just got it because we all felt that way. It was an impossible time. It was a global pandemic. It was a hard shoot. And it was like the second to last day. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful moment that I think of when I think of things like revelations and I think of things like inspiration and I think of, and I think of things like God, like what that, what that is, that level of intimacy and friendship in a group that large, never again, I'll chase it my whole life. And with that experience of playing a character where, you know, you keep com coming back to the space of, of it was about finding less and it was really about stripping elements down in your performance. What are, what are the aspects of that that you really see yourself carrying forward into other projects and other characters with that in mind? There was a lot in my youth as a young performer and as a student of acting where teachers and directors would say, you're getting in your own way. You're standing in your own way. Um, you don't need to be perfect. And I just, I didn't understand. I didn't get it. And I wanted to, I wanted to so badly. And that's part of the problem, right? That the desire overrode um, whatever was naturally happening. And, and through Midnight Mass, something changed because somehow the game slowed down for me to go back to our very important sports metaphors. Like it just, it was like, the, the ball just slowed down so I could hit it. I can hit it now because it's, there's less of a need to achieve. And so I feel like I have a secret, which is that the closer I can get to nothing is where everything is. I love it. I, I thought this series was so, so stunning and so much of it, it's because it's this really beautiful character driven performance led piece. And that's such a testament to the work that, that you've done on the show. And thank you so much for, for talking about all of this with us, Kate. Anytime. Thank you for having me back.